Um, there's a whole lot of fun up here about to happen, and I, uh, I have very little to do to introduce Mark Ray, uh, except to say when I first said, oh, he's our toy, when we heard that last year, he is in fact our toy this year. He's a toy boy, he's a teacher of the year from Washington State. You've maybe uh, read the articles in School Library Journal. He's had a, just a whirlwind and terrific year advocating on behalf of libraries and teaching and information technology. So it was a real slam dunk to have Mark do the keynote today. There were a, a few insights into Mark's persona that may not be immediately evident from the lilac and plaid and turquoise blue sock. Um, so I was hoping to just steal thunder and give you, if that kicks in, it's terrific, and if it doesn't, we'll just get started. But Mark, uh, Mark continues to amaze me with ways that he puts himself out in public um, to speak and to share. So if that's not loving, who cares? Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Ray. <laughs> So one of the things that the Teachers of the Year do now is to go and speak in front of Sipsi. So I was up at like 7.30 in the morning and it was a room, of, there were like 600, 700 people eating breakfast in this ginormous room. The Jumbotrons were three times that size. And here I am competing with, you know, uh, hash browns and, and eggs. And it was kind of tough. A um, couple, uh, couple of caveats. I just want to just, we'll get into this in just a couple seconds. First of all, my dress. I want to say something about that. Um, so, in, in many, for those of you that have known me for some past years, is I, I have this issue about not, you know, trying to redefine what a, what a librarian looks like, both in practice and in physical appearance. And so, for many years, I think people look at me and like, who the heck is that guy? That librarian really thinks he's a rock star. And, um, <laughs> you never know. Anyway, so, but you know, some of you may not know that I, I've taken on an administrative job, and now I'm the, the manager of uh, I, Information Technology and Library Services in the Vancouver Public Schools, and so now I'm a man. And so, so now the chatter is I go into the boardrooms, in fact, I intentionally bought these rock and roll shoes because if I'm gonna have to wear a suit, you know, I'm gonna have people saying, who is that guy? Oh, he's the guy that used to be a teacher librarian. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, um, so with that said, let's get this going. This is gonna be a, um, a very active, hands-on, get up out of your feet activity filled morning. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the overview for what we're going to be doing. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about how this all, all, all is going to work. Um, then we're going to have an activity called Typewriters and Tablets. We're actually going to physically get up and move around because this is early in the morning. We want to get you engaged. Brain science says we've got to do this kind of stuff. So we're going to do it. I'm going to talk a little bit about my desired outcomes for the keynote after we have a chance to kind of get our brains going. Then we're going to have an activity called Tablet Talking. Originally I was envisioning this being uh, tables. We don't have tables today, so we can still make it work. But we're going to have a little bit of conversation going on through the course of the presentation. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about the current states and some future states, about where the profession might be going. Uh, and then we're going to hopefully continue the conversations going forward. I would really appreciate Craig uh, talking about that word conversation. Um, it is really critical that we are engaged in conversation, not only as a profession, but also with the stakeholders, with our teachers, with our principals, with district administration, with people outside of our community. Uh, those conversations are absolutely critical. So my goal for today really is to start some conversations going. I'm going to say some things you really like hearing, and I'm going to say some things you don't like hearing. And some of you are probably going to walk out at the end of the day saying, I don't like that guy very much. 
because I'm going to challenge some things, some beliefs that we might have, that some of us might hold, that I think really are holding back the profession. So I'm going to challenge you, but again, the idea is to start a conversation. So once this keynote is done, as the, as the uh, conference pro progresses and you're having conversations over cocktails or coffee or whatever, I would hope that we could have some deep conversation. All right, so um, why unkeynote? Well, first of all, I think it's always weird when you go to a conference and someone gets up in front of you and says, this is the way things are, or this is the way things have to be. Uh, we live in a very uncertain time, and I'm not sure that any of us really know the way out of that. I certainly don't. I have some hunches. I'll share them at the end of the presentation. But before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about what we think and how we feel. Um, I think it's really important to be explicit about out outputs and uh, inputs and outcomes, uh, learning targets, so I'm going to be very explicit about what we're going to be doing as this uh, presentation progresses. Uh, in some ways, this is kind of a flipped keynote. So we're going to actually engage in some real-time research here in just a few minutes, and uh, we'll have access to some data. You are going to be posting any of you that have a personal devices, feel free to use them. Uh, you know, post up Twitters. I will have a, a few other things up so you can post online. So um, we're going to we're going to kind of flip the keynote. I was really struck. I found an article this last um, this last year uh, about how terrible keynotes are and how terrible presentations are when you go to conferences. And they talked about the fact that when you go to these, these workshops, the lights dim and everyone kind of mutely just looks at the, the presentation, maybe pays attention, maybe checks up on their email, maybe is texting their friends, whatever. But they, they, they tap into the idea that we really need to be having conversations, that this, 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 this top down, I'm in front, I'm going to share all the information with you, really doesn't work anymore because nobody works that way anymore. I mean, I've got my iPhone, I've got my iPad, I've got my laptop, I'm talking to you. So all of these things kind of happen simultaneously. So it's really important, I think, to have conversation even when we are listening to someone like me talking to you. And then the goal, of course, is some on ongoing uh, dialogue and participation. So, a couple ground rules, norms and expectations. Um, I'm going to be very honest about my feelings about the profession and about what I do and what I think needs to happen. Um, what I would ask you to do in just a few minutes when you have some activities, uh, I want you to also be honest. So I'm going to ask you some questions and I want you to be true to yourself in terms of how you respond to those. Uh, and, and in some cases those are going to make you feel really good, in some cases it's going to be like, oh, okay. Um, I think it's really important to be explicit about what our beliefs and biases are. Uh, all of us come to this profession in very different ways. Um, we all came to it for different reasons. Uh, we get up in the morning and go to school, and different things drive us through the day. Uh, so I think we need to own those and be comfortable with that, and that's just fine. And I ask you to be actively participating. And I know that for some of you, you thought, oh, great, I can just have my copy and then sit and you know, put everything out and plan my next day. No, you guys are going to be having to work in here in just a second. So we'll, uh, we'll be engaged. Okay, some tools we're going to be using. We're going to do some physical conversation because I think that's a good place to start. Uh, so we'll be doing a lot of that, but we're going to add some back channel communications as well. And I'll talk to you about that when we get to that point. Um, okay, so this is my expectations view. Please be mentally, emotionally, and physically present. Now, for me, that's a little bit different because I don't mind if you have a device in front of you or if you're typing or something like that. I know for some people that freaks them out. And I think uh, librarians sometimes, each librarian sometimes, that really you know, that, that, that upsets the sense of order. Um, I have no problem with that. I do that all the time. I do it kind of discreetly, but I'm okay with that. So if you want to do that, that's fine. But you need to be physically present with what we're doing right now. Uh, and then I would, we're going to have you react and talk and respond to some of the things we're talking about. Um, and like I said, continue the conversation with us about. All right. So this is, the, this is my set. This is the way I'm thinking of this, this issue. Um, I was in Princeton, New Jersey this last, uh, this last week. Uh, it was the last of the teacher of the year events. We went to Educational Testing Service and uh, also had a chance to shoot a video in, in New York City. So I just flew back from New York City on Wednesday. <laughs> it's got kind of crazy. I actually had, uh, had lunch with the publisher of School Library Journal. It was kind of cool. And the, oh, let me tell you, the, the gnocchi was amazing. <laughs> it was great. Um, very nice lady. Very nice lady. We had a nice conversation. It was really, really cool. The offices, you'd think they'd be really cool because you go into you know, New York and there's all these awesome tall buildings and stuff like that. They're awesome. Eh. You know, it, wasn't, it was, you know, it was an office. 
But I did get a picture of all of their book, their book room, where they have all their books, and it was a total mess. <laughs> it was, I mean, library, I'm going to have to post this on the blog. Is it like, you look at this, it's like, holy crap. I said, I actually asked him, is everyone going to take a picture of this? You know, so it's going to be out in public. Let me tell you this. <laughs> Um, so anyway, so on when I was at Princeton, we had this uh, this present presenter come and talk about neuroscience, advanced technology, and the changes that are facing education. It was an amazing, amazing presentation. It scared the crap out of me, uh, and it scared the crap out of the people in, in the room because the implications of forces outside of education. So in in, in business, in medicine. In, in big data, all those things are changing our world dramatically. And I'm not going to do a whole futuristic, you know, future shock thing. But the thing that was interesting is I've been feeling that pain for 15 years as a teacher librarian. I think the teacher librarians are the canaries in the coal mine. They're the first ones to sense, to use another analogy, as a dinosaur that the temperature is rising. And you're looking around and say, hey, where's Bill? He's not around anymore. It's too hot for him. Too cold. We're not sure exactly what happened in the dinosaurs. <laughs> but in that room with the teachers of the year from around the nation, state teachers of the year, the anxiety was, was just thick in the air because they realized how the future is going to change the profession of teaching. We've been feeling it for years. I've been feeling it viscerally for the last five or six in particular. I know that the changes are coming, and now with other teachers, it's going to be happening as well. So these are the questions I wrote. I asked him, I asked this, this guy, this Richard Farn guy. I said, how do you grok this? How do you grok all these changes that are taking place? It's overwhelming. Heinlein reference? I think that's right, Craig. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's Heinlein, right? Thank you. Um, how do you pull all this information together? It's overwhelming. How do you overcome the fear and uncertainty? All of these, we feel this. This is on a daily basis with the profession, the changes in technology. How do we deal with this? So I'm feeling this. And if you're feeling it too, then hey, we're in good company. So now we're going to do an activity called typewriters and tablets where we get up and we're going to actually be active. Okay, so that is my, this is my realia of the day. So in the old days, I think in the in Mark records, you could actually have a category called realia. I'm not exactly sure what it is. So that's my realia. He's not going to say anything. That is actually the typewriter of my father. Uh, my father uh, was a teacher for many years. He always wanted to be a teacher librarian. Um, anyway, that's his typewriter passed away some years ago. And I kept that because when I bought him, when we went to Europe in 97, 98, um, I bought him a computer. And uh, because I wanted to keep, you know, we wanted to keep in touch with email. And, you know, he really hesitatingly used it uh, to, to do email, but then he would go back and use the typewriter to type his correspondence and the messages to his, his, uh, his uh, doctors and that sort of thing. So anyway. Here's to you, Dad. All right, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to, the outcomes for this activity are going to be two. And I'm going to read this because some of the back might not be able to see it. Uh, we're going to validate the history of using technology. The teacher librarians have always been using technology extensively, but I want to point out the need that we need to continue to innovate. And I want to make explicit the diversity of technology usage within this room, okay? And the process is we're going to get up and move in response to prompts. So I'm going to put up the first question. I'll explain how it's going to work here. Okay. So if you all turn around now, if you all turn around now, you don't have to get about your seats, you'll see a Y and you'll see an N, all right? And, uh, and now the people in the back, Shelby and, and company, are going to get really cramped because we're going to have a whole pack of people uh, kind of move back and forth. And I'm going to ask him, give you a warning, I'm going to ask you about six or seven questions, and I want you to move back and forth. You'll notice in the middle there, there's a black line, and I want you to move back and forth. Now, this is where I want you to be honest, all right? I want you to be honest about what you do or you don't do. Don't try to impress your friends. If I ask you a question about something, it's like, yeah, I do that. I want you to be honest, because I want some real action research in place here, okay? So there are any questions. All you have to do is look up here. I will tell you what, to do, uh, what, what the question is, and we will move back and forth. Are there any questions before we get started? All right, and you don't really need anything except your bodies, unless you want to take notes about what your friends are not doing. So right now, I'm going to give you 60 seconds to get to the back of the room. And if you have used a typewriter, create a letter of paper, go to the Y. If you never have used a typewriter, create a letter of paper, you need to go over in the end. And you know what we may have to do? Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and come to the front, too. So basically, this is the line. Okay, so this is the line in the used typewriter. You need to be taller, Gary.
Let's just take a look here. We have a handful of people. I'm not going to say I'm good. That is a really small I got it now. Thanks, team. Uh, people that, that, have, that have never used the type writer before. Um, that's interesting. Okay, now we're going to have a little migration here. Next question. Do you own or have, do you own a, a tablet or have a district provided tablet? Do you own or have one? I have an Android. Yes, you stay here. No, you go over here. Okay? Do you own or have a district provided tablet device? I have an Android. Any tablet. It can't be a laptop, it has to be a tablet. This is quite as okay. Yep. If you, own, if you own it yourself, that's great. I just want to know if you actually own a iPad or tablet. Okay? If you can still move it. Okay, so a quick observation that I'm noticing here is that on the last question, the whole group pretty much was over here having to use the typewriter. Okay, so that says that's an interesting observation to me. Now when we ask this question, we kind of split the group up. So some people that were over here do in fact have a tablet. Okay, so next question. Let's, and again, you can think about these things too and have conversations as you're moving back and forth. Okay, have you ever used a laser disc? Go over here and ever use a laser disc. So, 
so this one separates, this one really separates the old timers from the really old timers. Time. That was the cutting edge of uh, digital technology. All right, last one. I think this is the last one. Do you blog, tweet, or contribute to a social network? Yes over here, no over here. Yes, that was an answer. So type in, you know, Mark Ray. Actually, my Mark Ray on that comes up because I'm logged in. But, so go to walwish.com slash wall slash typewriter. Post it up here. I'm going to refresh this to see if anyone's posting anything except for me. Yeah. <laughs> and it should be able to, it should show up on your page as well. If you have that. Thanks, Greg. And again, this is a, this is a great tool for you to use in the classroom in the library to get responses from students. Now obviously, in many cases, uh, students may not have devices in front of them. Certainly do this in the lab. It's a great tool to use. I think it's a great back channel to use, but have some fun with the conversation. All right, so these are my desired outcomes. This is what I want to do this morning. Now that we've got it all warmed up and our brains going. I think it's important that teacher librarians validate where we've come from and the leadership that we've had in educational technology for decades. Libraries for many years have been the place where you can get technology. And the thing that has changed in the last 
decade or so, is that we are no longer a sole source for the information, for the technology, and the resources in the school. That's gotten past us. And to some degree, that's happened outside of our control. We need to get over the fact that we're not the only place in town that has information and technology. Okay. So the bottom line is, is that we really do have a rich history of being technology users. The activity that we started off with was intended to illustrate that. So those of you that were using dialog, that was the internet, that was doing research on the internet before the internet even really existed. Okay, so those people were pioneers in the work that they did with research online. And we need to kind of reclaim that now. I think what we need to do is hold up a mirror to what I'm calling the emerging present. It's we are kind of at a tipping point right now. And so what has been just recently happening and what is just about to happen, the changes are going to be pretty quick and pretty dramatic. So we need to be ready for those. Um, I want to have a conversation, I want to provoke a conversation about what needs to change. And I, there's some things that I really think are important that we talk about. And I want to advocate for innovation. I want for teacher librarians to reclaim that mantle of innovation. That they're the cool people that have all the great tools, all the great answer, answers, the information, and they're the cutting edge. Because I think that's important. So, now we're going to do another activity. And I call this I kind of like the, the way it looks up there. Table, but it's tablet talk, so we're going to do both. We're going to do some face-to-face -face conversation as well as some uh, real-time communications. <laughs> so my outcomes for this are these. First of all, I want to probe some areas in our programs that may be areas of concern or issue. It's kind of like going to the dentist. You know, I just got back and did the cleaning thing, and they've got the little probes, and it's like, mm, you know, and you know, then of course you just told me that the dentist hasn't been fine, like, oh, I think you guys, that filling needs to be replaced. Ah, and I have such good home care too. I actually got complimented on my home care the last uh, dental uh, dental examination, but I still have got two fillings replaced. Ah. Anyway, so we do a little probing, okay, and that can be sometimes a little uncomfortable. Uh, we're going to hold up a, a mirror to this emerging presence. So we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening right now and then talk about that future practice. And then uh, we're going to do some physical sharing and also some digital sharing. So if you have devices, again, we'll encourage you to use those. And then we'll go over how to do that in just a second. <clears throat> so the way it's going to work is we're going to start off by taking a survey. Okay? So if you have a device, you're going to need to get it out now. If you don't have a device, that's okay, because what we're doing is we're going to get a scan of the room, a pulse of the room. We don't have to have everyone participate. However, if you have a device and the person next to you does not have a device, you can certainly share. We're going to do a Google Drive survey, and some of you probably have used these before. I think this is the best thing since Pan Pam. Uh, it's awesome. These are so easy to use. So like in, in, in Vancouver, I'll give you an example of how I use this Google, uh, Google Forms. So, we're going to be up, up, up teching our libraries. We're going to make sure we have interactive projectors, smart, uh, smart, uh, smart uh, document cameras, and uh, amplification systems. Make sure that all of our libraries are making crap. Some already do, most of them do. We'll make sure that's a standard. So I created this Google survey, and bam, I had all the answers in the spreadsheet just like that in every email. It's a great trick. So if you haven't done it before, use it. Okay, so to get to the Google Drive, of course, Google makes these long, nasty URLs. So you need to go to tinyurl.com slash Wilma Keynote, and then there's three questions, and I'll pull them up here. There we go. That's what it looks like. So to get to that, you're in good shape. And uh, there's three questions, and just go ahead and respond to the questions, and then we're going to go through each of the responses in the groups. Hopefully this works. And uh, take a look at that. So go ahead and do that now. I'll give you a few minutes to do it. You should be able to do it on a, a handheld as well laptops and it will take let's say about two minutes to do that. Then I screwed up, so she's the one that's most representative. Sorry. 
That's right. It's your home. It's 11.30 last night, okay? Yeah. So, what I'd like to do now is, I'm wondering, one of my wonderings now is this, what I'm supposed to be able to do right now is pull up a, a summary of responses. Uh, I'm not sure if I've given it too many responses or if my laptop's not working. So, what I was hoping to do, usually with Google Forms, you're able to get a real time show, a demonstration of, of how many people voted for various things. I tried that about five times and it doesn't seem to be working. So, my apologies for the inability to show you the data. However, with that said, what I would like for you to do is, regardless of your response, what I would like to do is do a, let's create a small table. So I'd like, originally we were, we were envisioning having tables. So I'd like to group in groups of four, three or four, okay, and do create like a virtual table really quickly. And I'd like you to do a 16 second whip. A 60 second whip means everyone speaks for 60 seconds. You don't engage in a conversation, it's each person talks for 60 seconds, all right? And let's, let's make groups no larger than four, because we're going to take four minutes to do this. And what I would like you to do is talk a little bit about why you buy or don't buy print nonfiction right now. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to give you, don't, don't move, just turn around a little bit. Go ahead, first person talks now, and I will, I will signal the change of conversation. Between 25 and 50 percent, 712764, and less than 25 is 712765. So we got 18 people. I'm going to let it hopefully go up all the way to 40, so we can get a reasonably accurate sampling of the room. That's now it's pretty much done. You notice how it locked up really quickly. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about Poll Everywhere. This is not a new tool. Um, many people have been using this for many years. I love this tool. It's a great way. I use it in my BYOD classrooms uh, when students, when I'm trying to get a, a formative assessment, you can use it as an exit slip. Um, there's another really cool tool called Socrative. Make a note of it, write this down, I'm not going to share it with you now. Socrative, S-O-C-R-A-T-I-V-E dot com. I am not impressed by technology tools much anymore, because I'm a little jaded. Uh, this thing is cool. Basically, it allows every device in your room, regardless of what it is, to be a responder. It is an awesome tool. So, Socrative.com. We're not going to use it because I haven't learned enough about it to share it in the conference yet. Okay. So, um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna speculate on this, but this is kind of an interesting indicator. How many students use non-print uh, print nonfiction in your library? 63% say more than 50%, uh, 18% say 25 to 50, and 20 20% say less than 25%. So um, interesting. I'm not gonna say much about it, but just again, it'll it'll provoke some conversation. All right, our next one, note taking. 
So this is going to be really hard for you to read. But the questions were, I, uh, in my teaching, I use the following tools to all that apply. I apologize to some of you that I didn't include an other on here, because there are other tools to be used. So it's no disrespect to any other ways you're doing it. But the questions were, uh, I don't regularly teach note-taking to students. I, since my Google Docs is not working, even though Steve, I think, tried to get it to work, just with a raise of hands, how many, no, I can ask anyone. Okay, let's do it this way, flip it around. Okay. How many people do actively teach note-taking in their library instruction? Raise your hand. I like the honesty, thank you. Okay, so it looks like about half or so teach note taking in the library. Um, so, do you use note cards? Do you use written uh, pen and paper Cornell notes? Do you use Google Docs or Drive? Some people use um, Cornell notes in a Word document, which is a great tool. Digo, Reddit, or another. How many people use Digo, Reddit, or another note taking tool like that? Digo is cool. I'm still learning how to use it, but that's so you see this low tech it works, you know. The hands, you know, when the technology doesn't work, the hands always do. Uh, and then does anyone use Notarize or any other note-taking apps on a sweet <laughs> the coffee? Yeah. Alright, here we go for that girl. Okay. So here's the here's the little conversation that we're gonna have around this. So we're gonna have an activity here. Now let's just do this as a as a as a shoulder uh, buddy. Choose a shoulder buddy. If, you, if you've had the same shoulder buddy all day long, turn around and talk to someone else. <laughs> uh, so this is an activity called affirmative inquiry. And what you do is you only think about the positive possibilities. Because we all, you know, it's, it's easy in you know, conversations about change in education. It's like, oh, crap, common core. What do we do about that? Oh, man, new evaluation program. What do we do about that? Okay, but there's some good things with those things, too. Right? Those, are, those are great initiatives. We're going to have great impact on our, on our practice. But we tend to kind of look at the challenges first. So this is an activity called a perfect degree. So if all students have a laptop or tablet, how could or would note-taking change for the better? Okay, it would change, it could have some problems. But we're gonna make the assumption if the students have a laptop or tablet. In our district, in Medicare Public Schools, we have a master plan to have most of the students having devices in their hands probably within the next five years. So that's coming. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like. That's our dream. We've got to make some money and you know pass some bonds and stuff like that and you know, get a few grants. But that's the vision in our district. That's where we're going. So something like this has some significant implications for districts like that. How many other districts, just again, we're going to go low tech here. How many districts have a one-to-one -one classroom or some kind of a one-to-one -one initiative in their schools? Okay. So these are not outliers. So I would be willing to bet that in the next two years, if I was to ask that same question, probably twice as many or more would probably be able to answer that question in the affirmative. Okay, so talk with your partner. Talk with your yellow partner. Uh, if students had a laptop or tablet, how could or would no taking change for the better? Cornell notes, Cornell baby. 
random, ineffective, difficult, slow, Jane Schaefer, hi Jane Schaefer, um, linked bibliography, lecture base, uh, laborious, unreadable, copy paste, blown off, isolated snippets, easily lost, copying and pasting, that seems to be a recurring one. Personalized and distracting, unsure hodgepodge. Does anyone watch um, Project Runway? I will not admit that. My wife has, okay? Even though, in spite of what I wear, yeah, I just gotta watch it. Anyway, so what's his name? Um, one of the. No, no, it wasn't Tim Guy, it was what's the other guy, the designer? What's the designer that's always? Michael Kors. Michael Kors. Okay, by the way, for the record, on Michael Kors, I had to buy some new suits for this Teacher of the Year thing. Let me tell you, that guy cannot, can't, he cannot make the camp, man. It made my ass look awful. Awesome. <laughs> So, you know, when he criticizes, if you watch Project Runway, and he criticizes, you know, the tailoring of the pants, you call him out to him. I record, you can't make a men's pant. Um, I, we should, I should tweet it, yeah. So, a blue minus one, unrealized potential, digital, private, dispersed. All right, so that's no taking now. We have one last conversation point, then we're going to move on to the next section. The next one is ebooks. So the question is about the use of ebooks in your library. So really the question is, is do you have ebooks in your library? And in what in case, specifically, what do you what do you have and how do you use it? So this is a little bit of an activity here that's a little different. It's a crumple and toss activity. So if you have, this is going to be analog pen and paper. Okay? So if you don't have paper, there's paper up here on the quarters here. Go ahead and grab one. And what I want you to do is I want you to write on a piece of paper one reason that you resist or struggle with ebooks. Okay? And then I will tell you what to do. No action other than that. Housekeeping is really going to be ticked at me. So write on a piece of paper one reason that you resist and struggle with ebooks. Why do you resist or struggle with ebooks? Those who struggle with them, I mean, I'm just going to throw them right over here. Just say, we'll go one, two, three. So purple up. This is another activity that you can use when you're working with peer groups, even with students, when you are facing some kind of an opposition to an idea or challenges. It's just a good physical way to kind of get those out. All right? Now, a couple of warnings. Okay, couple of warnings. Couple of warnings. No, I will not be injured, I promise. Okay. So, some of you haven't thrown anything like this for a while. So, so, don't throw too hard because you might get a rotator cuff injury. All right? So, I don't want anyone to walk out of here, you know, and then charge the bill must for, you know, you know, painful damages and, you know, whatever. So, I want you just to toss on a count of three. We're going to toss it over this way, and you guys are going to actually get fully bombarded. Awesome. All right. Here you go. Throw it, yeah, basically I'm your target. Oh, there we go. All right, one, two, three. Oh, that's good. That's good. I really wish I could have that in here. All right. I'm just going to randomly pick up a few things. All right. All right, so I'm going to pick a mouthful. This is basically the first time there's ever been a food fight at a library conference. Okay. So I'm going to. It's an e it's an ebook frustration fight. Okay, so uh, I'm going to read just three of them I randomly picked up. One is many platforms. No kidding. Okay, that one is blank. Oh no, it's this one already. It says access for all students. Yes. But you know, in my district, when we when we go to one to one, as we are at some point, it will not be an issue anymore. Uh, E-readers, lack of, not as hardy as a tablet. Yeah, okay, cool. So, all of this is true. Uh, at the same time, I really think that we need to be moving forward with ebooks. That's just my personal opinion. Okay, so now we're gonna do a short answer poll everywhere. Um, the question would be is this. This is the last one we're gonna do. It's gonna be where would you start or build your ebook collection? And I need to pull that up. I'll go with that in just a second here. Okay, again, this is the same one where this is a short answer. In what subject area would you start or build, continue to build your ebook collection? 
the number is 37607. You're going to text the number 712782 and then put in the subject for the area. Yes. Oh, okay, so you, for that you go to pollev.com. But it needs to be pollev, not poll everywhere. So if you go pollev, just like it is up there. Right? There? Yeah, you have to do pollev.com slash 7004, it should come up. If it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. History, social studies, fiction, classics, oh, we're all over the place. Fiction, social studies. Fiction, interesting. Fiction, AP Lit. Science, popular fiction, history. Simul oh, simultaneous access, curriculum related. That's an overachiever in that one. Uh, deaf, non-fit, common core. Rock on, family core. Eighth grade CBA for social studies. Yes, targeting a specific CBA, that's a great idea. Because I thought of it. Um, uh, non-fiction, non-fiction, non-fiction. Wow, there's a strong view of non-fiction. Special ed. History. Textbooks, read aloud. The most popular books currently surveyed. That's what you should have. So, um, again, interesting. The whole reason I, I guess I'm supposed to be here is I wanted to, I, I'm intrigued with the idea of 21st century skills for teacher librarians. We always talk about, we always are talking about 21st century skills for students, which is great. So those have been out there, there's all kinds of different consortiums and organizations that talk about that. But I'm kind of wondering, what are the essential 21st century skills for us as professionals? What does it mean to be a teacher librarian in the 21st century? What are the skill sets that need to take place? So I've got a few thoughts on that. I'm going to ask for a little bit of feedback, but this is going to be a little bit of kind of some thoughts that I have kicking around on that. First one I think is we need to be unflinchingly digital. Unflinchingly digital. No excuses for using digital. Okay? And I describe that as being an unapologetic informed consumer promoter producer of technology, digital content, and digital citizenship. And the important way of thinking of it differently is if you think about the food pyramid or that plate thing that they have the USDA has, is that digital are the fruits, vegetables, and whole grains of the library diet. And that's a shift from where we've been before. Is that that needs to be the majority of the consumption of the content in our libraries. So, indicators. If you are unflinchingly digital, these are some of the indicators that you might be feeling or seeing. Principal asks you for recommendations about technology purchases for the school. That's happening. That's good. Students and teachers come to you to know how to use a digital tool that you only learned last month. <laughs> Okay. The fact that you responded that way is great because that means you know that. You know what that's all about. So great. That's good news. The counter on your website is spinning. Or how many people get usage reports from their online databases? Raise your hand if you get usage reports. Okay. This is a great way to make the case for digital resources in your building. When you have IT guys like me say, I don't need any more money. You go to them and say, no, we're the number one user of these ebooks in the state of Washington. That's a really compelling argument. Uh, teachers ask for passwords. I had this one wonderful experience a couple of years ago when I was teaching. We had this health teacher that always comes in, and he basically takes a library for a period of time. Comes in, I did the first, the first period, we use these Gale e books. We have some great Gale e books for this drug and alcohol research project that he has. I didn't make it back in time for the third period. I was, I was going to be on time, he was concerned. So he logged me out of the computer on the projector and was showing the students how to use those Gale e-books. And this is a guy that I would never have imagined doing this. And he said, this is a guy I can do this. He's done this for two years now. You can so when teachers are do, using those digital resources, then you're in a good place. OK, next one, socially adept. Um, what that means is understand, understanding and working effectively in a variety of work groups, including teachers, professional learning communities, district teams, and external groups. You notice that I don't have librarians on that list. It is really critical that we are part of work groups outside of our own small little collection of people. Okay? 
I love librarians, I'm loving being here this, this weekend, but we need to extend outside that circle. Having, using, leveraging professional and professional, uh, personal relationships to strengthen your practice, program, and profession. Steve Poker, I'm going to do a public call out here. I would not be Teacher of the Year, I would not be writing this for School Library Journal if it wasn't for Steve Coker getting me engaged with the things that are going on in, in, in Washington Library Association and testifying to his legislation. He has been the reason that I'm here in front of him right now. Okay. That's because I had professional and personal relationships that were able to get me to where I am. Being widely viewed by students, teachers, and administrators as positive, effective, like, needed, and useful. I'm going to tell you a horror story. Teacher of the Year, I will not mention the state. Okay, so I've been hanging out with Teachers of the Year for a few months last year. Talk about a horror story about a teacher librarian in their school that is feared by students and teachers. <laughs> and if you're laughing, we should laugh nervously because they are hurting our profession. Okay? I talked with another teacher librarian who has a library. The rest of the district is automated. They still maintain a card catalog. <laughs> Those are coming from Teachers of the Year, their own experience in their libraries around this nation. Okay, so indicators. Libraries full of students, even if they're not required to be there. Okay, we're all proud of the back and forth the classes coming. If they're packed in place, good. Teachers seek you before you seek them. That's a good indicator that you are socially adept. Active part of the building, a state, other groups, teams, and circles, and that you go to happy hours. <laughs> and first round on, on, on seashells tonight. Okay. <laughs> Professionally adaptive. Professionally adaptive. This is, you need to be highly reflective of yourself and your profession. That you are thinking about how you fit into the whole ecosystem of education, your role, how it's changing, and so on. If you are not thinking about that, then we're a little concerned. Willing and able to learn new ideas, techniques, and strategies without external direction. Self-starting innovation and change. And then a perception of yourself as innovative, creative, and inventive. Okay? Indicators of that would be an instruction and program changes not just year to year, but lesson to lesson. That you are challenged but not overwhelmed by change, innovation, new products, tools, and techniques. We, can, we all feel the pain. We're all overwhelmed. We just have to get past that. And you consult with or go to other people for help or you can do to find how to do new things. Is that you're willing to extend out beyond that. Instructionally active. This is the most important thing of all. Being a teacher of the year this year, I heard very little mention of libraries. When I went to the Capitol, talked to decision makers, libraries were not part of the conversation. Teaching was. Teaching is what we need to be doing. And we all know that in our hearts, but because of all this stuff that comes up, we kind of get and kind of lose contact with that. We need to be active teachers, and if we aren't, we're not going to have a job for much longer. We need to define ourselves first by being a teacher and then by being a librarian. Uh, we need to use effective instructional strategies. We need to be the best teachers in the school. And I can say, my colleagues, Ron Wagner over there, he is one of my heroes in terms of instructional practice. I've got other people. Yeah, yeah, so over there. I mean, I've seen some amazing things go on in his library because he's a great teacher. And then extend that leadership beyond the classroom. You need to move beyond the library. So the indicators: you're teaching more than librarian. You, mean. <laughs> you are far more busy teaching than doing anything else. You have a rich role as a collaborator and you coach with teachers, and you're active in school district working conversations about teaching and student learning. Okay, I'm going to skip this because we are running out of time. I would invite your comments on the blog, Twitter, if you want to. Go ahead and move on to the next one here. Uh, I would invite you to do this. Actually, make a note of this if you would, please. This is actually going to be active, the wallwisher.com slash wall slash I got skills. So please make a physical note of that. I apologize, we're running a little short. But I would like for you to do is to, if you think of one, add one skill that isn't on that list. And I will get that onto the blog so I can share it out with people. So it's wallwisher.com slash wall slash I got skills in the spirit of uh, Napoleon Dynamite. So wallwisher.com slash wall slash I got skills. I'll also post that on the blog so if you find my posts, if you don't have that, we'll look at there. Okay, so I'm going to close with a couple things. This is going to be the serious part. When I talk with decision makers, with administrators, 
with teachers, everybody outside of the library circle, I am always positive and I'm talking about what teacher librarians and school library programs can be without fail. I am always being positive about it. But as I talk to fellow professionals, I'm concerned. I'm really worried. I was asked by School Library Journal to process the data from their survey that they just compiled and it scared the crap out of me. And I wrote a response to it, I think it's going to go online in a few weeks, about the challenges that we face nationally, okay, in terms of where we are. I think we're facing extinction. I hate to say that in a public place, but I am really worried about that. And it, it is by forces within our profession and by forces outside of our profession. And we may not have a choice. Um, I am wondering, and these are wonders, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't landed on this, but these are the things that keep me up at night, in the words of Joyce Valenza, that the words library and librarian might be a problem. I know with many administrators, it is. I know with a lot of decision makers, it is. It is perceived as old, it is perceived as backward leaning, and I see some administrators in the room. Okay. That doesn't mean that libraries are not still important, it doesn't mean that teacher librarians are not important, but the name might be a problem. And I will be very explicit here in things that I firmly believe in. So I'm going to own what I believe in right now and I'm going to share it with the public. This is not about saving jobs for a profession. This is about student learning. If we do not add value to the educational program in our schools, then why are we here? I really believe that. Digital is the new print. Digital is one more. We can still love our books. We can still enjoy a paperback. We can still have you know, books in our library for students to check out. But the bottom line is digital is the new print. And it will continue to be that way. It's not going to go back. Typewriter is case in point. Technology is no longer imminent. It is imminent. This is kind of a religious philosophical term. It talks about how technology is embedded in everything. We can't refer to it as the other. It is everything that we do, everywhere we look, whether we like it or not. It's not this or that, it's this and that. And I think about that specifically in that, that tension between print and digital books and computers, it's both. But like I say, digital is also the fruits, the vegetables, and the whole grains of our life. And last but not least, and this is where I talk about these two examples of teacher librarians around the nation, not in Washington State, because you don't have that teacher librarian in Washington State. <laughs> you are either the solution or the problem. Is that we have to rise up and be the leaders. We need to be the ones that, that, that are the, the innovators. We need to be loved, respected, be the powerhouses. And as I look around this room, I know that most people are in this room right now. In traveling around the United States, it was amazingly cool to talk about Washington Library and Media Association and about the great things that are happening in Washington State. We've got things figured out in the state. We are doing good things. We have more work to do. But I am so proud to be a teacher librarian and to represent Washington State and the great work that we're doing here. And it's in many, it's because of your work and because of the leadership of Washington Library and Media Association. I'm not being paid to make that endorsement. That's a good feeling on my part. So even though I am now an administrator, I am always a teacher librarian, and I'm very proud to be a teacher librarian. So, promise, closing thing here, if you want to get your cameras out. Originally, I was envisioning you know, a power tool of a different sort, but we decided to land on a Sawzall. The, the, the motto is, the takeaway here is, we have work to do. Okay. And I know that all of us are already working hard, and we can do more work. So with that in mind, Here's the, uh, here's the Sawzall. Yeah. So if you are ready to do that work, I want you to stand up right now. Come. Months and years to come. Enjoy your conference. Thanks again.